Tan. I appreciate that. Thank you for inviting me today. Um, a little bit about myself. I started keeping bees about eight, nine years old. This is my mom back here. And at that time, USU sent out a pamphlet. And on that pamphlet, I had beekeeping. And that was it. I was hooked. Um, we actually, the first year, the professor wouldn't let me in. The second year, my mom actually had to take the class. Being a parent now, I really thank my mom every chance I get for taking me because she had to attend all the classes the professor wouldn't let me in otherwise. So that was a lot of fun, and I appreciate that, Mom. Um, time went on. Now we are commercial beekeepers. We've been commercially keeping bees here in Cache Valley. We have 65 bee yards here in northern Utah. Some of your faces I recognize because I pollinate a lot of gardens and in those areas, but we're strung out from Plymouth, Utah, all the way down to Croydon, where the cement plant is. We go back up in that valley. Um, beekeeping here in the valley is very important. There's some row croppers. I don't see a, most of them here, but I do pollinate a lot of squash. Squash is very hard to grow. Is there any beekeepers here? How many of you have your own hives? Three or four. Great, great, great. By next year, we'll have you all into it. Um, I brought some slides today. Um, these are from the University of Ohio, Ohio State Beekeepers. And uh, what we're going to talk about a little bit is some of the equipment that you're going to need to get started. Um, Ton also told you I was the county bee inspector. And so the part of that job is I filled a lot of phone calls that are really fun. It kind of breaks up the boring day when you get a, a new phone call. Um, one of those is, can I keep honeybees? Well, everybody can. The only reason and the only ones that shouldn't are the ones that uh, if they get stung, they die. So um, other than that, everybody can keep bees. Um, just make it you know, a positive experience for your neighbors also. Um, I did a 4-H class a couple of years ago. My goal was to have 4-H kids run their own hives, bottle their own honey, and then take it to the county fair just like they do the pigs and the steers and market their honey. And uh, we got all the way to the county fair, and then none of them would sell their honey. That was their honey, and they weren't going to sell it. That was it. Wouldn't even buy it. I couldn't even buy it. And I even tried trading. Um, in the Box Elder County, we did get a, a couple of brothers that actually went to the fair with their honey, and each of them put ads by themselves put 930 bucks into their own accounts. So that was very successful. I was very proud of those guys. Um, there is a Cash Beekeepers Association that meets the first Thursday of every month at the Whittier Community Center at 7.30. This is a very informal group. It's, um, I kind of tell people it's like cheers without the bar. It's just a good group of people. Um, the camaraderie is great. Uh, it's a $10 fee per year to join the club. But what that does is they have two extractors. And that's the biggest cost of, of keeping bees is extracting the honey, getting the honey into a jar. But they have two extractors that are free of use if you have your club membership dues paid, which is 10 bucks. It is a, a really good deal. Uh, usually what happens is three or four of them, uh, backyard beekeepers will get together and then use the equipment on a Saturday and extract it and clean it all up together. And that way it's really quick and simple. That way the new people that haven't done it before can kind of mentor along with the people, the old hands of, of doing it. And so that works out really good. It's a really good organization. Also on Facebook, um, there's a Cash Beekeepers Facebook page too, if anybody are Facebook users. Okay, the equipment. Um, since I've gotten started, I've, I've kind of I've watched people, and some of them use veils, and some of them don't. And I've always wondered, and I've always been mystified about uh, the veil and the suit and everything. I, I wear mine. Um, you know, my, I, I have a lot of bees and, you know, I'm going to work 150 to 200 hives in a day. And so I'll have a lot of bees in the air, but I've always been mystified. This, so I asked an old beekeeper, um, why do you see these pictures on TV? And they, they don't have gloves, they don't have a veil. And he says, well, take a look at how many bees are in the boxes. There isn't any. And sure enough, that was, that was true. There isn't any bees in those boxes, so wear a veil. Don't feel like, a, you know, that you're a sissy because you wear gloves and a veil. I do. Um, so that's a protective clothing. Um, shoes are very important. My mom sews booties in my coveralls, and so I slip them right into my sh shoes. That works really good also. Um, a smoker is very important. The only two tools you really need are the B-Veil. Um, I'd get you a set of coveralls and uh, a good pair of shoes. But the hive tool and the smoker are really the only things you need. The smoke, what that does is it trips a reflex in the honeybees. So that they think their hive's on fire, they all gorge themselves like it's Thanksgiving. What happens is they can't bend their thorax to sting you. To sting you, they actually have to bend and then sting. So their tummies are full and they become a lot more docile and don't tend to sting as much. 
So that's the purpose of the smoke. Um, so that's the Cache County Beekeepers Association. Man Lakes LTD online is a really good resource. Usually from January, February, and March, they have free shipping. And they are a large uh, mail order beekeeping company that works. ManLakesLTD.com. Yeah, it, it's right here. I'd push the laser, but I think I'd erase everything. And they're a real good company to work for or work with. Um, there's a couple of different ways to get started. Um, a swarm, a package of bees, a nook, and an established hive. And we're going to kind of go through each one of those because that's, that's probably the number two phone call that I get is, okay, what do I do? And so a swarm, uh, uh, they're kind of rare. Um, what happens is, is a bee colony gets overpopulated or it, uh, it, it's ready to divide. A cow has a calf, a beehive has a swarm. So what happens is, is they raise a queen and just before that queen is going to hatch, the old queen takes off and takes half the bees with her. It is the most magnificent thing, it gives me goosebumps every time I talk about this, it's the most magnificent thing in nature that you've ever seen. 60,000 bees in the air, the smell of the honey, the roar, it, it is phenomenal. The bees are so docile that when they land and they're hanging there in a, in, a, in, a, in a swarm, you can actually take your hand and stick inside of it and pull it back out. You can feel the vibration of the bees. Um, have you seen the bee beards that they do? That's all trickery. That's a swarm that's a baby beehive. They're not protecting their hive. They're not protecting their food stores. They're not protecting baby bees. So they're very docile. They don't want to start anything because they're so exposed. And it, 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 it causes fear that the phone calls are the greatest in the spring because of the panic. You know, you've got to come now. You know, it, it, it's amazing. And um, I did one up by the Logan Golf Course a couple years ago, and it took me four hours to do a five minute job. I had all the neighborhood kids over there and and it was amazing to it turned into a class and. It, it was amazing. It was a lot of fun. It really was. To, and, and I did it without a suit. That's the only time you can wear, don't, you don't need a bee veil and gloves because they're just very docile. So if you ever get to see a swarm, that's one way to start is to catch a swarm. There's a swarm list. If you get in, in with the club, then you can get on a list. And when a swarm lands, they just go down the list. You have your equipment ready. You run out and grab it and it's free. Okay. Yeah. No, it does not. And it happens less and less and less because the health of the colonies are dropping a little bit. Um, and so um, usually the rule of thumb also is if they're still in the bee yard, if they're like visible from hives, then they're not public property yet. But if they leave and they're hanging somewhere and you can't see hives, then they are public domain. And so they're not my bees anymore. <laughs> so that's a... Um, Disadvantages of, of a swarm is uh, they didn't come at 5 o'clock, and so you kind of have to be flexible on your time to go and get them. Um, you have no control really over the genetics of, the, of what you're getting in the, in, in the queen. Genetics in honeybees, um, where I've been in honeybees for a long time, I kind of understand a lot more about it. but. Um, Let's take cows, for instance. In cows, you have Holstein's Jersey, Brown Swiss. You know, they're all different colors. Honeybees are the same way. You have Carnolian, Cardovian, Italian, um, Midnight, Starlight, Buckfest. Um, there's all kinds of different bees, and they're all different colors. They're all visible with the eyes. So when you look at a hive, every hive is a little bit different color. Buckfest, for instance, is a bloodline that goes clear back to uh, Father Adam, who traveled the world in a sailing ship in search of the perfect honeybee and uh, back in the late 1800s and still today those bloodlines go back and they're they're bought and they're sold um, semen is collected in straws and sold just like any fine race stallion um, it, the breeding on these the, it, it's a small world but very passionate um, these these people are very very serious about the bloodlines and the bees and where they came from and um, and where they're headed to um, also with a swarm uh, b they may carry a disease I, that's not a real big deal. Um, starting with the package of bees. Um, package bees are 
taken the surplus of the bees off of a large colony. Normally packages are shipped in from California where spring starts a lot earlier. They'll harvest the bees off of them, put them in a three pound package or a two pound package, put a queen in there and ship them out. They're in a little wooden cage. You can kind of see them stacked up there. But uh, the cage will come to you, it gets there at five o'clock and uh, you install those in your hives, it's ready to go and, and then they take off and go. Um, some of the disadvantages of a package is that uh, they don't, uh, there's, they're, they're usually started on foundation. They don't have any brood with them. So a honeybee around here usually lives about, let's say, 40 days during that time of year. And then their wings wear out. So you, the population takes a big dip. It takes 21 days for those first eggs to hatch. So you're looking at at least 10 days you know, for the queen to get in there, get settled down, to start laying, maybe seven days if you're, if you're good and lucky. So you're gonna get like a 30 day dip. So you've only got a 10 day grace period there for that package to pull out and where the baby bees are starting to hatch to replenish the population. So they're, they're very temperamental at, at that point. Um, this is um, probably my fi favorite way, and this is what I've been doing with the bee club members. In the springtime, we all get together. I take two Saturdays in May. I take the first Saturday and the second Saturday, and anybody that wants to come out, even if they're not starting bees, you have to bring a bee suit because it is hands-on. And uh, I have a really nice bee yard out in Menden up on top of the cemetery. And so I put bees there that anybody that wants to comes out and we do a, a beginning beekeeping class, kind of like this, but without the PowerPoint. We actually get everybody in bee suits and work through a hive, um, a full size colony. And then we work through the brood and show them what the brood is, what the brood's supposed to look like, what the drone brood looks like, all the way down through the food stores, the pollen and how it's stored, where it's stored. And we do a, a really good, um, it's usually we do the same thing two different weekends, that way everybody can make it. Um, I'll tell you a little funny story. I didn't realize so many people were going to attend. And so I started with the first group of beekeepers, got them all dressed, and there was probably five or six of us. And I'm on my knees working a beehive, and we're passing um, the frames of the hive around with all the bees on it. And I look up, there must have been 50 people standing around dressed in white. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was an ominous feeling, all these angels standing around. It was <laughs> kind of took my breath away, and I started laughing. And they said, what are you laughing at? And I said, you ought to be down here on your knees looking at this. <laughs> so, that, so that's kind of fun. So what we do on a nook, um, the center ones right here in the red are brood. That's the baby bees. That's in the egg, larva, pupa stage. And so we'll have all different ages in there. That takes that dip out of a package. Um, so that that's going to be hatching the whole time you're getting that queen going in there. Um, and so what we do is we have the three frames of brood, two frames of pollen and honey on each side, and that makes a five frame nook. And then we make those up in a regular deep box your equipment. And then uh, we get them queen right. Um, so the advanced class that we did last year, we actually raised our own queens. Helped, uh, there was about eight of them that I helped them raise their own queens and got them going. The queens hatched. The first round died because it rained for um, two weeks. And then, so we got new cells in there and, and we hit them on the second round. So that was a lot of fun. It was a disappointment when they didn't hatch, you know, when they couldn't mate. Uh, queens have to fly to mate. It has to be about 70 degrees with no wind. And they have to fly out. They find a drone congregation area. They mate midair and then they come back to the hive. So if it's raining, there's no chance of any flight time taking part. So that's what I meant by it was a miss. So we went on from there. But anybody that wants to do that, um, all that information will come through the, the bee club. And so it's, it's a real fun time. Um. When I first started helping the bee club about six, seven years ago, if you had two or three hives and you lost a hive, then you bought a package the next year. And one thing I've been working with them is that you can make increase out of your own hives. Once you have a start, it's like propagating plants. You can propagate from seeds. Well, you have the seeds, so why do you need to go to the nursery and buy new plants? So that's the, another advantage. Um, established hives. This is probably the most expensive way to do it. Um, unless you are a little bit more advanced beekeeper, then you can buy an established hive and then break it up into nooks. And then... Um, start from that way. But an established hive, the more bees that are in a hive, seems to be that it's more intimidating to people. So if you start out with you know, 60, 70,000 bees versus 10 to 12,000 bees, it's a lot more scary. So that's, that's about uh, 
all we need to do on that. Um, I'm gonna have my mom start around. I brought you a treat. Um, this product is our new product from Slide Ridge Honey. Um, it's, it's vinegar. This is a vinegar that is made from honey. The only thing in that bottle is honey and water. We just released it in January, and sales have been going really well, so I thought that'd be, kind of be fun. My mom has it on a plate, and she'll just kind of pass it around and refill the plate. And I uh, warn you, it uh, has a lot of flavor, so just a little sip at first and see how you like it, and then kind of go from there. Okay. Am I going real too fast? Are there any questions? Question. It is. There's only two of us in the United States that's making this. Um, the process is, is quite phenomenal. It took me seven years because I wanted to go to a value-added product in, in, with the honey because I can make very good honey and make quite a bit of it. But if I ship it to Denver, there's already honey there. And so now I have the cost of shipping on top of my honey to compete with the local market. And that just, you know, it just didn't make a very good business model. Um, there was very, several things that I went through. I, I, we also make a cosmetic. It's a bee balm. Um, Burt's Bees you might be more familiar with. All of her recipes were in the American Bee Journal about 30 years ago. It was an archived issue, so I got that and then branched off on my own. And, and, but my niece is running that under Bee Simple Products. And so there was that, but it, it just wasn't quite the what I wanted to do because everybody can do that and so it, this took me seven years and what happens is I take the honey and I add water and yeast to it and ferment it into mead which is, is a wine and then I do it the old way I use acerbators or mother I've never figured out why they call it mother but mother is a category of bacteria that eat alcohol and so they float on the surface and eat all the alcohol so there's no alcohol left in it and turn the alcohol to acetic acid which is the vinegar yeah um, it takes me about, industry today can do in two hours what takes me three months, but they don't get this. <laughs> oh, my mom will bring it around. Another question? Slide Ridge Honey. Uh-huh, Slide Ridge Honey. It's the rock slide over on the Menden Mountains. It's a, a landmark that uh, we grew up with, camping and, and such. Um, a bee tree. These are very, very rare. When I was a kid, I had about eight of them, um, meaning when I was 12, 15 years old, I knew where about eight of them were. Um, does anybody know where one is today? You've got one? Keep your eye on it. I'd love to get the genetics out of it if it's if it, two, three years old. Um, one of the reasons is that you don't see them anymore is the Varroa mite. Um, the Varroa mite came in in about 1984, and uh, comparatively in size, if a mite was as big as my fist, and I was a honeybee, it would be stuck to my back. And what it does is it bites and feeds off the honeybee's blood, basically. But parasites also carry a lot of viruses. There's 26 known viruses. There's three of them. We know they're there, but we can't tell what they are. And that's one of the major problems in the industry today is the varroa mite. It's very easy to take care of. Um, if you have five, two, three hives, you can use powdered sugar. You just dust it on there a cup per deep and uh, dust all the bees. You have all these white ghost bees flying around. It's really cool. But it makes the bees heat up and then they start grooming and the mites come off. So you don't need harsh chemicals. You don't need um, a tactic. You don't need you know, the nerve agents that they use or miticides. You can do it organically and it works very, very well. Yeah, let's talk about that right now. It's a good time. When you start a package of the bees, one of the most, the, I, number one things that I have problems with new beginners is they're bees. They'll take care of themselves, which is not true in this day and age. In this day and age, we have monoculture. Um, looking out right now, you see pasture and you see corn. Okay, there's not a whole lot in bloom. Bees have to be fed, especially when they are a small nucleus or a nook. Um, they have to be fed. I use high fructose corn syrup type 55 to get that hive started. Now bees, they will store that, they'll eat it, they'll consume it, but they're also producing a lot of baby bees. They're stimulated and they get going. And you have to, you have to feed them to get that population to come up. That's the secret of producing a honey crop, is you've got to get that population as high as you can to come in. The only time you produce honey is June, July, and August. And so to, to, to peak that colony in July, um, and you start with a nook, you need to feed one gallon of type 55 every 10 days. Yeah. 
Um, in, my, in my operation, we use several additives. I have a plant-based vitamin that I put in there. It's actually a human vitamin that uh, I started researching about. It comes in a powdered form. And uh, I started researching about four years ago. And then I st implemented it into my queen program. Um, we raise all of our own queens. And so we're completely self-contained out in Menden. But uh, what it did was it, it supplied something. And my queens came out when they hatched. They actually came out with an attitude. I mean, they, would, they did. they come out and walk across the frame. They didn't come out and was weak and, and then look around for honey. I mean, they came out and those workers just backed away and let them through. It, it was an amazing, it was, that, it was that visible to see. And so that went right into my queen program. Now all my hives get it in the spring. I'm not familiar with that one. In B vitamins? <laughs> yeah, I know, the, I know the vitamin that I'm using is high in B, in the B complex vitamins also. But one, uh, one thing you have to be very careful with honeybees, um, like molasses. Bees love molasses, but it gives them dysentery. And uh, it opens them up, and th th that's a mess. Um, 60,000 bees, yeah. <laughs> so you have to be a little bit careful with that and test. Um, another additive that I use is uh, white oak bark. Um, white oak bark is for nosema. Uh, nosema, it was, it's been in the country for a long time. We had nosema apius. Now we have nosema serrana. Nosema is a single cell protozoa that basically has a spear, a, a spring wound spear on it. So when we get it, when you become stressed or um, your body becomes weak, you get, uh, it's a diarr diarrhea type deal, but it, it's caused by this, and honeybees get it. Uh, it's a real big problem in the wintertime because the bees are enclosed and they can't take cleansing flights. And so uh, with the white oak bark, that helps them out really, really a lot. Um, um, I boil the oak, the oak bark. Um, I got the recipe out. Um, if you come out and get feed, it'll have it in it. That's the best way to do it. If you come out and buy feed, then it has it in there. White oak is a, is a tree. You guys, you guys are probably more familiar with it than I am. But uh, you take the young bark off in the spring, and then you boil it, and that gives you, um, wouldn't be a tincture, but it would give you a, uh, a white oak extract. And that has full of tannin, and that's what I use. So it's made by boiling the bark and I add it to the sugar water. It's quite tasty, too. <laughs> it's like a tea. OK. Um, oh, I haven't got my picture on there, but that'll be me. I get to um, hopefully help you through. Um, as bee inspector, the bee law, everybody's supposed to register. And uh, by law, I'm supposed to come out and visit. Yeah, uh, it doesn't work like that. If you register, that's great. I hope you do. But unless you have a problem and you call me and make an appointment so that I could come out or you bring your equipment over, I'll get there quicker, then we'll inspect your colonies. Otherwise, I do a lot of uh, classes like this, and we go into bee diseases and what it looks like, and I actually bring diseased comb out, and then we can identify it, then you can go home and, and look at yours and, and see. And then if there's a problem, then I can help you with it. It used to be, question in the back? Um, actually, if it's in my range, I have bees clear down in Layton, and uh, there is a, 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 another bee inspector down there, but sometimes he can't get to it, or sometimes it overwhelms him a little bit, and so I will meet them on my way down there. But um, cash and box elder, um, normally we can meet somewhere, you know, or bring the equipment in. Usually the bees are dead by the time I get involved and somebody wants to know what happened to them, um, and so... We just kind of work it out on a case-by-case -case basis. Mainly, the education is, is the big part of it. And there's a lot of books um, nowadays on it, and there's a lot of access to information on the Internet. The Internet has some... That's through Utah Department of Agriculture, but it comes through the county. It's a state mandate. But uh, anyway, I think everybody should keep these. Um, foul brood, for instance, they used to recommend burning the hives. That's not true anymore. Um, a wood fire will only get about eight, nine hundred degrees. It takes eighteen hundred to kill foul brood, and so basically burning the foul brood like they did in the old days, just atomized it, threw it up, and and spread it out to all your neighbors. And so, good strong bees. D disease isn't really a big problem. 
um, mainly the health of the bees, keeping the virus loads down, making sure the mites are taken care of and that they have food. And, and everything usually goes pretty smooth. Foul brood is a, um, a baby bee disease. It, it is uh, in the larval stage. And what happens, it's a bacteria. And so the bacteria, I have a, I have a picture. This is some comb. So what we're talking about is in the first eight days. So when it's an egg and then uh, a larval, that happens in this stage here. And what happens is the bacteria basically kills the larva and then it starts to decompose. Um, it is very smelly. It, uh, I liken it to the locker room dirty sock smell. Yeah, times 10. Sure, sure, this is the life cycle of the bee. Um, the queen bee is a, there's two types of bees in the hive. There's the queen and the worker, they're the females, and then the drone bee is the male bee. So a queen bee's life cycle is 16, it, it's an egg, larva, pupa, and adult, and it hatches on the 16th day. It, it, it's amazing clockwork, boom, it happens. Um, the worker is an egg, and then it hatches, and what differentiates the worker from the queen is the diet. So all the bees are fed royal jelly the first three days of life. Basically, the first 72 hours. After that, a worker bee is fed a less nutritious bee bread, which is made up of uh, um, pollen and a little bit of honey and some royal jelly. It's not as nutritious, whereas the queen is fed the royal jelly her whole life. So basically, a worker bee is starved or malnourished, and then she doesn't develop properly and have um, the organs that work properly to lay the eggs. And so that's a worker bee. And that takes 21 days to hatch because her metabolism slows down also, not getting the nourishment. Um, royal jelly is, is amazing stuff. Um, it, it truly is, is the building blocks of all life. It is very, very nutritious. A drone bee is 24 days. Um, the, only prop, the only job a drone bee has is basically to mate with the queen and fly around on warm summer days and make sure he gets his share of the honey. Um, but as, gen you know, as far as genetics go, um, we, we really strive to make sure that the drone has just as good as genetics as the queen that I'm raising the bees from. You know, the drone's the other half. And so if you're going to be mating queens, we go to mating yards, which I specifically put hives there, specifically put drone brood in them, and specifically raise those drones to mate with my queens coming out. So it's kind of a, a, an intense program there a little bit. It gets confusing because they all look the same. <laughs> Did that kind of go over the life cycle a little bit for you? Um, a worker bee in the summer will last 30 to 40 days. And that's all they live in the summer. The bees that are born right now that are, are, will make it through to spring. These are the winter bees. These are the most important bees right now for the wintering of the colony. So if we can get really good, healthy bees, and a lot of them born right now, then they'll make it through the winter. When they get into fall like this, um, my mom said she's seen frost on the ground this morning. I, I don't know, it was close. But uh, the first time it freezes, the hive will kill all the drones. And they'll also push out any bee that's weak or sick so that they downsize the population to a point where it has the best chances of making it through the winter. So uh, that's another problem of being a drone. You're not going to make it through the winter. Okay. Okay, that's the that's the end of that one. Um, any more questions? How'd you like the vinegar? Good, 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 good. Crumb Brothers is carrying it downtown, Third West and Third South. Uh, Caputo's in Salt Lake. Yep, Harmon's in Salt Lake. Um, the immigration one also carries it. Utah County. Drive up to Harmon's. <laughs> We're not that far. We only released it in January. Um, we soon will. Um, we're just finishing. You wouldn't believe the paperwork involved with getting a product on the shelf and the delivery and the logistics and the paperwork coming back and the billing. And we're just getting all that set up. And so um, on the Internet, I'll ship you a bottle. <laughs> Um, the Queens, what we do is um, you come out and to Menden, and they're pickup only. 
And so we have to kind of go through a program um, so that I, I had a gentleman buy 20 cells and then he took them home and put them on the kitchen counter and then put them in the next day. And then he was upset because he had made all of his nukes and none of the cells hatched. And, and it's like, no, you can't do that. When you take them home, they go in now. And, you know, they're like a very fragile egg and you can't leave them on the dashboard of the truck. And so we some stuff like that to, to um, Yes. Uh huh. High placement and bee etiquette. Um, the first thing for a beehive is water. It's amazing how much water on a hot summer day a beehive will go through. One hive will need at least at least a gallon of water per hive per day, and they need easy access to it. Um, so if your neighbor has a hot tub or a swimming pool, which we don't have too many problems around here, but they will go and get water. Um, there are some of those uh, garden, rock gardens, and you know if that's the closest place, that's where they're going to get the, the water. Um, I would talk to your neighbors first. I have, I, there's only been one or two instances out of several thousand that I've been involved with that the neighbors absolutely couldn't deal with it. Um, most of them come to tears and thank you. I mean, it is so amazing to bring them into a neighborhood, um, you know, because every, uh, you know, the little gardens and stuff, but you wouldn't believe how much it changes tomatoes. I have a row cropper in Layton that starts calling me in January to make sure Zoe's garden that I'm there. He claims that I not only increased his production by one third, but I improved his quality by double. He says, you wouldn't believe the difference in the tomatoes. You wouldn't believe the flavor difference in the cantaloupes and the squash because in a cantaloupe, each one of those seeds has to be pollinated. And if you pollinate all those seeds, well, then the fruit develops properly. Raspberries, berries by the bay down there. Um, he starts calling me in, in late part of January and early February. You're going to be here, you know, and uh, his crop depends on it. He's tried to produce it without him. So moving into a neighborhood, most of your neighbors are just going to love you. Um... Mm-hmm. Do, do the bees make it to your place? I don't know. Do you see them? Do you see them on dandelions or some? That that's pretty good if they're making it that far. Normally, I don't. They say bee, honey bees will go out five miles um, to forage for food. I I really don't see that a lot anymore. I see bees maybe a mile, and and then they're they're headed back, and so um, but. Uh, um, I, I, I think you can put bees on your place very easily and your neighbors would love you, especially if they get a little, um, a lot of you probably should have brought some raw honey for you to taste. The, the difference in raw honey versus honey you bought in the store is like a tomato out of your garden versus one you bought at the store. It is that big of a difference. And once you've had it, how do you go back? You just shun them in the grocery store. Okay, I got to have one, one, and then you wonder why you bought it because you've, you've just been spoiled on that flavor and, and, and that goodness. And that's what you get when you have, you know, your, hunt, your, bees, your own bees. And you know where it's been and, and the production and everything. Um, honeybee, yeah, honeybee placement, I would keep it kind of away from the irrigation. The only reason is, is that it will rot the equipment. Morning sun is very important. Um, the heat, they want full sun. So like if you put a beehive underneath those big black willow trees, it wouldn't do very good. It's too shaded. But if you put a beehive, say, um, right over here along the fence to where that sun came over the building and hit those first thing in the morning, that would be an, an awesome place right there. As far as how far away, um, I have an observation hive that has glass on both sides, and it's a three frame, and uh, it sits in my master bedroom. And there's a pipe that goes out my window, so the bees go out the window, out through the pipe, through the screen, and then come back in, they fly free. It is the most amazing experience in your lifetime. Uh, here's, I'll tell you why. Bees are very sensitive. Their back legs, any vibration, and they go zzzz. The, it, it, one of the kids will get out of bed in the middle of the night. I'm a sound sleeper, but those bees are just a constant zzzz. And then somebody would get up or something would happen in the house, zzzz, and you're up instantly. Um, when the spring comes around, the apple trees and the cherry trees start blooming. They bring in that pollen, that fresh nectar. Look, it gives me goosebumps. 
it is just absolutely amazing how that smells and from day to day the the different smell of the the bees and it is it's a fascinating connection to nature to to the earth and and what's actually going on to tie yourself to the season of you know what's going on outside and and life itself the ones that are in the hive they fly free they come home every night honeybees have to come back to their hive every night and so Mm -mm. No. The sprinklers are out and about, and the irrigation system leaks a little bit and has a little spray on it, and they congregate there. And um, They will collect morning dew. It's usually too cool. Bees don't like to get up really early. Um, they're usually about 10 o'clock right now, 10, 11 o'clock. They'll start milling around and flying when it starts warming up a little bit. But they will fly late in the evening because it's so warm. So they, they work a little bit later, but they're not very early risers. I like that about them. <laughs> <laughs> um, we don't get that hot here. Um, I, I visited some beekeepers down in Blythe, California, and one of their requirements was you had to pick up a rock and throw it in the Green River. If you couldn't hit the river, you couldn't put bees there because of the water need of the bees. It's 120, and if you were further away from the river than that, your hive would actually melt. Um, the, the wax would melt uh, and it would all run out the front door and it would be a, a, a terrible mess. And you couldn't have equipment out without bees on it to keep it cool or it did melt. We don't really get that hot here. If you did paint your hives black, you could probably overheat them. But uh, um, once the, when it's, it, you know, when it gets into the high 90s, the plants become stressed too. And they don't produce as much nectar and the bees shut down. If they're not getting something, they're not expending something. So when they're, you know, they have to expend energy to get to that nectar, and if there's none there, they shut down. Uh huh. Um, in Canada, in Canada, they wrap them all with uh, roofing felt, and uh, you need to leave, you know, an air breather out of it. The main problem with wintering bees here in Cache Valley is that we get that wind on top of the snow and it grinds that fine, fine powder off that blows into any crack. And uh, what happens is, is that blows into the hive, lands on the cluster, that, and then the cluster's wet. And now you have cold, wet bees and it's really hard for them to fight. Also, there's some winters um, that we get down to 30 below and it stays that way for two or three weeks. What happens is, is they won't move on to, uh, on to frozen honey. They'll consume everything that's right there that they're sitting on, but they can't move on to new food stores because it, it, it's too cold. And then they will starve to death right there. And that happens sometimes too. Um, well, the placement of the hive is, is really critical. So with that south facing there on the barn, you know, with that dark wood, I would put hives for the winter right in front of that because you're going to get that southern sun. It's going to be soaked up with the solar energy there on the south, and it's going to be warmer right there. The dandelions and the weeds will come out three weeks earlier there than anywhere else, and, and you can use that to your advantage. Um, it, it, there's other advantages, too. Some people bring them right inside of the barn for the winter. winter. Um, they used to bring them into the root cellars, and uh, there is, still is... Um, there's a beekeeper up north that uh, actually has had bees on it um, since the pioneers came in, and they actually did a dugout and buried the bees in underground for the winter. You know, there was their own, you know, the moisture was a little high. It, it worked. I mean, what else do you do with them to keep them around for the, the following year? I do not. We truck them to Alamo, Nevada. 80% um, of my income in the beekeeping business comes from pollination of agricultural crops. So um, we're starting to get things arranged now and start trucking to Nevada in about 30 days. And then they sit there, and then um, the last week of January, we go through everything. Um, by February 7th, we're moved into South Valley Farms, which is 18 miles north of Bakersfield. And all my bees are taken there on the almond orchards. And then they're rented there. And then March uh, 23rd is my release date. And we have to get out of there within 10 days, and then we start bringing everything back to northern Utah. We set up, we raise queens, we make nooks, and get ready to, for our honey crop June, July, and August. And then also, um, we do a couple rounds of queens. 
that uh, for more bees, and then they all go to southern Idaho for onion seed pollination. And then that's another form of income, and, and so everything, they're all back now. They're only there for 30 days. And then so they're back, and we're congregating them, getting ready for winter with those hives, making sure they're fed up to wait, and they have plenty of food stores to make the trip to Nevada and then into California and back. No, it's actually a 48-foot drop deck, a semi-trailer. Um, if you contain bees, um, they will panic and die. It would be like if, if they locked us in this room right now, which would be kind of hard, but if they locked us in a room, most of us would probably panic. I would. And, uh, and they rush the doors, and then they all pile up, where they, and there's no oxygen. Bees take an extraordinary amount of oxygen to run a hive. Um, they're little, but that the, the, the mass in there is huge. And they have to expand, you know, expel carbon dioxide like everything else. So if you put them in a, in a van trailer without a lot of, you know, without like a refrigeration unit to keep them cool and to keep that oxygen coming in, it would only take minutes and they would all be dead and overheat really quick. Yeah. Um, there is a real, there's a bunch of top, gar, top bar guys in Cache Valley. Um, they're on the, that Facebook that I tell, told you about, and also the club meeting, they're, they're usually always there. Um, there's been some of them that's been very successful this year with them, and it's worked, and now we're going to go into winter, and, and uh, I think they'll do real well. Um, they work very, very well. Now, as far as production, or, or, you know, it, it wouldn't work for me. Um, I think it's fascinating just because it's bees. But uh, um, they work very, very well. But where you also can rent the extraction equipment for 10 bucks, you know, they're, they're the, the, the pot bar hive, um, you know, what makes them nice is you just cut the comb off and then you crush the comb and, and, uh, and do it that way. It takes 8 to 12 pounds of honey, depending on the sugar content, to produce one pound of wax. So you can see, you know, with the top bar hive, my hang-up has always been, well, that takes me eight pounds of honey to make that pound of wax to hang, you know, that, and then the bees don't get to reuse it. And so I, I think the production there is a little, whereas with the, the Langstroth hive, then it, you reuse that. Yeah. Um, how many I'd like to take or how many do I actually take? We get about 2,000 down there. Double deeps. We run everything in double deeps. That way it all fits together. And uh, our honey supers are double deeps, and our brood chambers are double deeps. But our honey supers are never interchanged with our brood chambers. We always collect honey on brand new wax. So it can be used the second year as long as it was honey production the first year. But it, it never goes from the brood chamber to the, to, to the honey box. Uh, 2.3 to 2.8 depends on the production and the um, there again almonds um, the rent the orchard we're on has about eight different varieties um, they have a, a mild nut the nonpareil that is really good and then they have some strong ones that wow raise the hair on the back of your neck they're so strong and but uh, depends on what variety um, hard shell or soft shell depending on how the trees are loaded and how old the trees are Yeah, about 160, 140 to 160. No, that's for 30 days. Yep, that's for 30 days. Yeah, it's slideridgehoney.com. S-L-I-D-E-R-I-D-G-E-H-O-N-E-Y.com. Two minutes? I got my two-minute warning. Last question. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Um. Well. If you're going to overwinter the, winter them inside, it needs to be totally dark 24 hours a day. Any light, they come out. And um, bumblebees in a greenhouse will do their job. They'll just fly around and pollinate the tomatoes and, and do their job. Honeybees will fly against the window and just ping, and then they'll die. 
and and so it, it's a if if I was going to winter bees here in Cache Valley, I would definitely find a spot out in the open, like that barn, where you can get that solar you know effect there, or I would put them inside where it's totally dark for that January February period, um, that those coldest ones, and uh, yeah. Africanized honeybees, they stopped in the southern hemisphere on the, hum hemisphere on the 38th parallel. They're a tropical bee, um, you know, and uh, the only thing that really makes them dangerous is when the hive gets over 100,000 bees, they become very angry. Um, there's really, there, there's beekeepers in the northern area that have just as mean bees. I mean, some of those are, are mean. Uh, also, a bee hive becomes very mean when it's hungry or the weather's bad, um, you know, and then food, you know, their, their food is shortaged and a beehive or is sick. Um, you know, that, that's one way when we pull into the bee yard and the bees start pinging you and stinging, you know something's wrong. They're either sick or they're hungry or, or something's gone awry. Normally you can walk into a bee yard and this time of year and, and not even be bothered. But if there is something wrong, they're telling you something. But Africanized bees, they've stopped. And I, I, they, you know, they have the scare things that they're going to come this far north. But the one thing it has affected is most of the queens were raised in the southern states and in the northern part of, Cal or in the warmer part of California. All the bee queen bees for all the United States, and that's where they were shipped in. So we've been getting genetics from the southern states for years, and that's one reason why we started raising all of our own queens and doing our own queen program for the last six years. Is hey, these aren't queens aren't working. They get up here and it gets cold, they die. You know, they don't have the food stores. They don't have the body fat to, to winter. And so... The, the only problem we had was out in Hiram, um, a new beekeeper started, and uh, he bought 100 nooks and put them in his backyard. Um, the next adjacent to the backyard was a soccer field. That was a little bit of a problem, and that was kind of a no-brainer, and he called me up for sympathy, and when I got done chewing him out, then... <laughs> but, uh, you know, two or three hives in a backyard, four hives, is not a big deal. You'll probably never even notice that they're there. Brigham City is the only one that has an ordinance, and uh, I was told by a beekeeper that lives next to the mayor, and the mayor said, put them in my yard then. But, uh, good that comes from honeybees and I think if they're managed properly that uh, they're a real benefit. Um, the Salt Lake Library downtown if you go upstairs you can look right out the window and there's, bee, there's a beehive right there and nobody even you know it was there for a long time behind a, a screen and nobody knew it was there and then you know after it was there for two months they took the screen down to see how I feel sorry for them. I truly do. I truly do. I think it, it loses touch. You know, 1% of the population feeds the total population. And if you lost, so really, if we lost 1% of the population, would it make a difference to humankind? Yeah, if we lost that 1%, it surely would. The honeybees are in peril. Um, you know, I, I don't know how all your guys' gardens are going, but I get so many phone calls from gardeners that can't set squash, that can't set cucumbers that wonder why their, their berries are deformed. And, uh, you know, I, I think the city of Orem really ought to think really hard about shooting themselves in the foot. There is a business in Salt Lake that uh, leases hives like they do a fish tank. They will come out and maintain it for you. Um, I, I don't myself do that. I bring out a whole yard, a truckload, and we do some pollinating. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. You're welcome. I, we had a question. Oh, Martin, M-A-R-T-I-N, at slide, S-L-I-D-E, ridge, R-I-D-G-E, honey, H-O-N-E-Y, dot com. No, I'm leaving. Unless my mom changes my mind. <laughs> Way in the back. It's at the Whittier Community Center. I don't have the address memorized. It's, it's up by the temple. 
It's a community building, um, and it's at 730. It's where? It's in the phone book under Whittier Community Center. And it's a lot of fun. Um, sometimes they have treats, too. We should probably, if anybody has a final question, we should probably move on. Uh, kind of um, yeah, we can go on. I have seven of them. And we'll kind of go on maybe a little bit more advanced. If it's the same people, then we'll go on to a little bit more advanced beekeeping. And, and uh, I have seven that starts out you know, really light and then moves up and finishes on grafting and queen rearing. So we'll probably do one of those tomorrow or something. Not grafting and queen rearing, but a little bit more advanced class. Now that you're at that level. Two cards around the applause.